Uh, if you've got a Bible with you, go ahead and open up. We're going to be in Psalm 139 today. Uh, if I haven't met you before, by the way, my name is Brian. I'm on staff here, and uh, I uh, look forward to meeting you after service. If you're new, feel free to come and meet me. But if you have a Bible, Psalm 139. If you don't have one, there's a Bible in one of the seats, uh, underneath the seats in front of you or around you, and the page numbers for those Bibles are on the screen. Um, the page numbers for the blue Bibles are on the screen, and we also have these uh, Psalm scripture journals that we've been giving out over the past handful of weeks, and the page numbers for those are on the screen as well. And we have a bunch that, of those that we want to give away and get rid of, because that's why we bought them. So if you don't have one you want one, um, you, can, you can put your hand up and we'll have someone run it to you, or you can go to the back of the room and grab it. But as we're reading, feel free to uh, grab one if you don't have one, but we're going to jump into Psalm 139 today. And so what we're going to do in this series is we're looking at the Psalms and we're, we're not so much, um, the goal isn't just to give you all the background information possible and to, so we come away knowing every single thing about the Psalms. The, the goal is to uh, pray through them and to read them and to learn from them and to apply them to our lives. And so we're going to be reading through the Psalm a couple times today, but we're going to start off this morning just reading straight through before we really dive into it. So Psalm 139, starting in verse 1, it says this. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Before we really dive into it this morning, let's take a moment and let's, let's pray together. Father, we, we thank you for these psalms. We thank you for um, these, these words that were written that we can use just to pray to you and pray over our lives and pray over our families. And God, I pray for us this morning. I pray you give us uh, hearts to hear and ears to hear what you have to say. God, I pray you be with me, that you speak through me, that we can all leave today having grown just a little bit closer to you. God, we love you and we pray in your son's name. Amen. So Psalm 139. Uh, that was a little bit of a longer psalm. If you were here a couple weeks ago, we memorized uh, Psalm 23 together. We will not memorize this entire chapter together, unfortunately. Um, but so what we're going to do, with this, how this chapter is laid out, is it's laid out in four um, stanzas, or four sections. Depending on your Bible, they may already be broken up for you, or they may not be. But we're going to kind of take them stanza at a time. We're going to reread through each section, and then talk about it a little bit, and see how we can apply it to our lives today. So the stanzas are kind of, uh, they kind of go back and forth between, emphasize, between um, having an emphasis on God and on the psalmist, who in this case is David. So it kind of talks about God, then talks about David, or the, or the self, myself, then back to God, then back to myself. So we're going to start with stanza one, as we kind of go back through the scripture today, starting in 139, starting in verses one, this is verses one through six. It says again, it says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me, you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. So it starts off by saying, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. 
The word know, if, you, if you've been at Lake Springs for any period of time, is the Hebrew word yada. This, Derek talks about this pretty regularly, that the word yada means a lot more than just to know somebody or just to have some knowledge. It's not the same as if I know some of you, but it is a knowledge that goes so far beyond that. It's a knowledge that goes so much deeper and so much more intimate than just the knowledge we have of each other. In fact, it makes me think of when I was in um, like uh, middle school, middle schoolish. Um, I met, well, I guess we had met before, but I, I officially met my wife, Brittany. Um, and we, we, we met through, if, if anyone is around my age and uh, millennials and so forth, you meet people in uh, chat rooms. And if anyone remembers like AOL online or AIM, they had chat rooms. And so our, our middle school youth group had a chat room. And so like every Sunday or whenever, every, all the students would go in and chat with each other and stuff like that. Um, and her and I had been talking in there. Now I knew who she was from afar, and everyone knew who she was. she was, she was very popular. And we were talking there, and then we ended up talking outside of there, like on Instant Messenger, never in person, but in, on uh, AIM. And uh, we were talking, and I, I just kept thinking, like, man, I'm never going to have the guts to talk to this girl in person. So I came up with like the most genius plan, and it, I kind of half believed it, but I, I told her, and I was like, you know, I don't think you actually know who I am. I don't, I don't think you actually know me. And, and she was like, no, I know you. I was like, I, I don't think you do. I don't think you do. And then, I, and then it came down, I was like, oh, well, maybe you should prove it and come and talk to me in person. Now, we were part of a really big church. There was like, the student, there was like hundreds and hundreds of students, so it's, it's very possible that a lot of us didn't know each other. And um, so that was, my, that was like my, my devious plan of like, I'll, I'll get to talk to this girl, but I won't have to have the guts to actually do anything. And so one Sunday, as I was walking up the stairs at the church, I hear her yell to me. And she goes, hey, Brian. And I look down, and she waves, and she's like, huh, told you. And that was our first in-person conversation. It was wonderful. <laughs> um, but come to find out later, actually, she, we had known each other a long time before that, and my mother was actually her Sunday school teacher when we were young, which I didn't know at the time. So I was, I was way off. But we, we ended up dating in, in eighth grade and so forth. So we've been together for like 20-some-odd years. And, but the way we know each other now is much different than the way we knew each other then, obviously. Me, me in eighth grade or seventh grade or whatever was saying, you don't, you don't know me, and her saying, yes, I do. That's much different than the knowledge that we have of each other now. And even as much as that has grown over time, the knowledge that God has of you is so much greater than that. In fact, we can just put it very basically and just say that God knows everything about you. God knows everything about you. And for some of you, that may seem very comforting, that the God of the universe knows everything about me. But if you're like me, that sometimes maybe isn't so comforting, that the God of the universe knows everything about me. Everything isn't just the good things. Everything is the bad and the ugly and every thought I've had and every action I've done and every motivation behind every action I've done. And when we start to think about it that way, that gets a little bit more intense. But the fact of the matter is God does. He knows every single thing about you. And I think it's so fitting that after that section of David talking about God, you know me, the next section that he goes into talks about where can I hide from you? Because I think we've all been there that um, once uh, we get to know somebody so well, it can be easy to try and hide from that person. We're, we're so guarded as people that we don't really, we want to know people, but we don't want people to really know us, right? In fact, if you've ever experienced uh, having someone from your past that you knew like when you were growing up or when you were younger kind of re-enter your life, sometimes it's easier to be like, ah, I don't really want to re-engage that relationship because they know me in a way that the people that I know now don't really know me. And we can be, it can be easy to just kind of cut off those relationships or to be guarded from those relationships before they get a little too deep. And so the thing I love about the Psalms is honestly they're just so human, there's very human. God, you know me. And then it talks about where can I hide from you. So let's move on to the second stanza, starting in Psalm 139, verse 7. It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become uh, night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. 
See, we, we see multiple instances in the Bible of people wanting to hide from God or people running from God. And we see it all the way back in the very beginning, in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, right at the beginning, uh, after Adam and Eve eat from the tree that God instructed them not to, this is what happens. Genesis 3, 8 says, Then the man and his wife heard a sound, heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, among his own creation. They hid from him because they were ashamed. Or we can look at Jonah. Jonah was instructed by God to do something he didn't want to do, so he hid. In fact, the book of Jonah opens up with exactly what Jonah did right from the very beginning. Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed up to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. See, this is not uncommon. The idea of wanting to hide from God, the idea of wanting to get away from him. But the fact of the matter is there is no hiding from God. In fact, the psalmist here uses four examples of places to hide from God. He talks about the heavens, the depths, the sea, and the darkness. When he talks about the heavens, says uh, even in the heavens, he's not talking about heaven. He's not talking about where God is. The, the idea of the heavens is, is, is the idea of the skies. And it's this place that's, that's unattainable for, for us to get to, for people to get to, as the psalmist is writing. But he's saying, even in the heavens, I can't hide from you. Even in the depths. Other translations say Sheol. It was believed to be the, the, place, where, the, the, the place of the dead, the place that was cut off from God, a place of darkness and despair. And he's saying, even in this place, I can't hide from you. He talks about the sea. The sea is, is not, the, the way you would have understand, understood it, is not the way that we understand it today. The sea is this thing of chaos and this thing of disorder and this thing of terror, this thing where we don't know the ends of it. But he's saying, even if I go as far as humanly possible across the sea into the unknown, into something that I've never been before in a place of danger that I'm terrified to be at, even there, you would be there. And then he talks about the darkness. And the darkness here is so much more than just the, the, the literal lack of light. The darkness is the opposite of light. And it's thought to be a place of uncertainty and fear. But even, even in the story of creation, it tells us that darkness was all there was before God harnessed the darkness and caused light to separate it. God has power over all, and no matter where we go, there is no hiding from him. Now, you may have experienced this when you were, maybe if you, when you were younger, where you try to hide something from the adults in your life, from your parents. And especially in that kind of middle schoolish age, what you learn as you become an adult is that you were probably just, your, your parents probably knew everything that you were doing, and you probably were really terrible at hiding it. In fact, if there are any like, middle schoolers in the room, anything you think you're hiding from your parents, you're, you're probably not. They're probably just letting it slide. But when, when I was that age, uh, me and my friends at school, we would get together and we thought that we were the, the sneakiest. We thought that we were getting away with something, and for a while, I think we actually were. But we would get together every weekend, we would spend the night at each other's houses, and every night after whoever's parents went to bed, we would sneak out. And we wouldn't do anything. We, wouldn't, we didn't drink, we didn't do drugs. We would sneak out just because it was cool to walk around at night. And that was it. Because like, it's, it's something you weren't allowed to do. So we would, just, we would just walk around. I had a friend who lived on a main road, and you could see really far in each distance. So we would walk on the main road, like in between the yellow lines. And that was like, that was as rebellious as we got. And it was cool. <laughs> but, and it, it was always fine. We never got caught as far as we knew. No one got in trouble. Until everything came crashing down when we did it at my house, of course. I had all of my friends spend the night. Uh, they all, my parents, everyone went to bed, and it was late at night, and we're like, all right, let's, let's sneak out. And so we snuck out, and we kind of snuck out my garage, and we have a dog pen behind the garage. We snuck out there and left it cracked so we could get back in and not lock ourselves out. And we're just walking around the neighborhood, no big deal. We're just, we're just doing nothing. And then we start thinking, well, we're out here. We should ring some doorbells, right? And now this is before, like, ring cameras or anything like that. It's like, it, it was easy. To, you just ring and run, and you can get away with it easily. And so we started doing that. We started going down and ringing people's doorbells, and we just, we're, just, we're just causing mayhem across the neighborhood. That's what we think. In reality, people probably aren't even waking up. But we, uh, I start thinking, there's this guy at the end of our street, like, far from where my parents live on the opposite end of the street, who was always really mean. He would always yell at the kids, and he was, he was just always angry all the time. So I was like, let's go get this guy. So we go down and we ring his doorbell and we all run and hide. He comes out, looks around, goes back inside. 
So we're like, all right, let's get him again. So we go and we ring his doorbell again. And then we all run and hide. He comes out, nothing, he looks around, goes inside. And then we're like, all right, let's get him again. So we go and we ring his doorbell again. And he comes out just screaming into the night at this time. He's like, who's ringing my doorbell? And we just, we think it's hilarious. So we're like across the street in a bush, terribly hidden, but we're like, he's never going to find us. And then he goes back inside and then we see his garage door open and he comes out with a flashlight and gets in his car to start looking. And this is where us as middle schoolers, we just panic. And we do the genius thing where we all just run different directions. And we all just, everyone just scatters and splits and runs. No one talks to each other. We all just run every which way. And I'm the only one who really knows the neighborhood at night. And so we're all running and then, and everyone ends up coming back with a different story of what happened. And so we, me and two of my buddies, we kind of ran together and we're running through yards and we're just trying to get back home. And we run through this one guy's yard and we didn't notice he's actually just standing on the porch watching us because we had gotten his house earlier. <laughs> and as we get into his lawn, we're like five feet from him. All of a sudden we just hear this voice and he just goes, that's not a very good idea. And we freeze. And we look at him. And he looks at us. And we look at him. And we, we lock eyes for what seems like 10 minutes. It's probably a second. But we're just locked eyes with him. We're like, I don't know what we should do. Should we apologize? Should we run? And then after a few minutes, we just, we just ran. And so we're running back home. And we're running as fast as we can. And I get to my neighbor's yard right before we get to my house. And it's, it is a dark, dark night. Like clouds are covering the, the moon and the stars. You can't see anything. And I was, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, as we're running through the, yawn, the, the, the yard, I get tackled by a dog and just tackles me to the ground. I'm like, what is going on? And I'm so disoriented and it turns out it's my dog. It's our, it's our boxer. Her name is Megan. And Megan tackles me to the ground and just starts licking me. And I don't understand what's going on, but I grab her. We take her inside and I get inside. And of course, everyone's awake because what happened was my older sister came home after we left, let the dog out and we left the dog pen open. So the dog just got out and then she Woke up my parents, my parents went downstairs, saw no one was home, so everyone's just waiting for us. So we get back, we're just, we're, we know we're dead, we're in trouble. We just go downstairs, we're like, my parents are like, where's everybody else? We're like, I don't know, we'll, we'll just see what happens. <laughs> and so we, we're, we're waiting, and, and then they start trickling in. Everyone starts trickling in. The first guy, my first buddy that comes in, we're waiting in the basement, he comes down, he's out of breath, he's like, guys, did you know the police are here? Like, like, oh my gosh, like, we're, we're so dead. We don't know what's going on. The police are here for some reason. And then a few minutes later, another one of my buddies comes down. He's just, he's panting, out of breath. He can barely catch his breath. He's like, guys, like, they got him. We're like, they got who? They're like, Jacob. They got Jacob. He's gone. <laughs> we're like, like, they got, they, who got him? He's like, I don't know. We were, he's like, we were hiding in a bush, and this guy comes up behind him and grabs him by the neck and drags him into his house, and I just ran. <laughs> And we're like, oh my gosh, he's dead. And, uh, and as time goes on, eventually Jacob comes home, thankfully. And it turns out it was the guy that, we were, that was standing on his porch. He, he caught him. He didn't catch us, but he caught him, dragged him inside, made him, call, made him call his parents, found out which house we were at, called the police, and everything just unraveled. And it was, I never saw any of them ever again. It was, it was terrible. Um, why am I telling you that story? Um, the, the fact of the matter is we all thought we could hide from our parents. We thought we were getting away from it for a period of time, that, that, we, that there was no catching us. We were dumb middle schoolers, but we all do this at times where we do something, and you know what? It, nothing really bad has happened. You know, I, I, have, I have this issue or this this thing that I am doing or, or that this part of me and I know it's wrong, I know I shouldn't do it, but nothing bad's happened yet. It's not hurting anyone around me. Honestly, I'm living with it just fine. And we feel like we can go on as if we're hiding it from God or hiding it from other people, but eventually it always comes out. And see, we can look at this one of two ways, at this idea that there's no hiding from God. We can look at this one of two ways. We can look at it kind of in the way that I've been framing it, as if there is no hiding from God. No matter how hard we try, you cannot hide from God. Or we can kind of flip it and frame it in a way that I think the psalmist is actually trying to frame it. And not that that's a negative thing, but that that's a really wonderful thing. Because the fact of the matter is that even though there's no hiding from God, the reality is God is always with you. God is always with you no matter where you find yourself in life, no matter how alone you may feel, no matter how dark of a place you feel like you're in, you have not been abandoned. And God is with you even when you don't feel like being with him. And this is what the psalmist is saying. Not that I want to hide from you because I don't want to be with you, but that even when I don't feel like I deserve to be with you, you are still there with me. 
Even in my darkest points, even when I don't feel like I deserve your grace and love, you are there and you're with me even in my worst points. And if we want to know why God is always with us, we can find that answer in the next stanza of the chapter. So let's move on. Psalm 139, starting in verse 13, the next section. It says, For you created me, or for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. So why does God care about you so much that he wants to always be with you? It's because he created you. And he didn't create you as in he created everything, and so, he, so that means that he created you. He created you on purpose. He created you the way that you are, or we could look at it this way, that God carefully created you. God carefully created you, not you as in all of us, but you specifically, and me specifically. God put thought and care into who you are and how you were made. See, we can see this passage and the, the, throughout, this, throughout this chapter, the, the idea of God's sovereignty is, is kind of all throughout this chapter. And what that means, that's, that's kind of a big church word, and all that means is that God is Lord and has supreme power over all creation. That he knows all and has power over all. And that's a very comforting idea. Until it's not. That's a very comforting idea until we realize that that encompasses both the positive and the negative. That God can't be sovereign over some things if he's not sovereign over all things. See, David says, um, he says, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. He's saying, you know it all. You know everything, God. And to have that kind of knowledge is something that I cannot fathom. That is beyond anything I can even imagine. The knowledge that you have is so great and so vast. But we have to wrestle with the fact that even though God has the supreme power and supreme knowledge, that tragedy still happens even though God is sovereign over all. And especially, I don't want to ignore that in this section, especially in this stanza, we are talking about ideas like birth and creation. And you might be sitting here listening to this, having gone through something in your life, um, having gone through something like losing a child, or having a child that was born with a disorder or disease, and you might be sitting here thinking, How does the idea that God carefully created everybody apply to me? And I want to say that's a really, really good question. And so first off, if if that's something you're going through or have gone through and are kind of wrestling with that right now or wondering about that right now, I want you to hear me in saying that my goal in what I'm going to say is not to try and explain anything away. That grief is a good uh, is, is something that we need to go through and grief there's no help in grief by just trying to give an explanation tragedy is something that should be mourned not explained away but in how to answer the question of god's sovereignty in the midst of tragedy if i were to try and give an answer to that i think i would be much more comfortable going and looking and going to someone who is much smarter than myself and so there's going to be in a minute there's going to be a quote up on the screen that i'm going to read it's a little long but i'll just read us through it And it's from a woman who's a Bible teacher and an author. Her name is Nancy Guthrie. Uh, She's written some really great books, and she wrote one that is uh, devotional for people that are walking through grief. And the the reason that it was written, kind of her story, is that she had two children that were born with a rare genetic disorder who both only lived six months. And so she is someone who has lived, not just has some knowledge of this, but has lived this. And so when, when talking about the sovereignty of God in the midst of situations that we don't understand, this is what she says. When something bad happens, the sovereignty of God is a very hard truth to accept. Because if he is in control of everything, we wonder why he has allowed this universe to be ordered the way, in a way that causes us pain. But when we begin to think that the God I know would never allow this, we have taken our first step toward discovering that God is not who we think he is. 
That is when we can begin to explore the wonder of his sovereignty. Though God's sovereignty can be hard to accept, it is also a soft place to land. It is a rock underfoot when winds blow in our lives. It confronts what seems absurd in our existence. God's sovereignty is our greatest hope as we face uncertain and the unknown future. So I'll be the first to say, I don't understand everything God does. And if someone tells you that they do, then they're wrong. Because if I understood everything God did, he wouldn't be God anymore. He would be a product of my own imagination. I don't understand everything God does. However, when we're dealing with tragedy, I think, and I, I think I can, and I hope that we can, try and find some comfort in the fact that God is sovereign overall. God is in complete control, and to me, that is far more comforting than the alternative. While I may not understand everything God does, I would rather live in a reality that God is in control of than to believe everything is just random. But regardless of if it feels like it or not, regardless of, of, of the things that we are going through, I hope that we can rest assured that God did carefully create you. And on that, that takes us to our last stanza, which admittedly, as we begin to read, takes a pretty hard shift from where we've been. We talk about God, you know me. Um, God, you know everything about me. God, you are always with me. God, you carefully created me. And then Psalm 139, starting in verse 19, the, the tone seems to shift a little bit. And, and we'll see what I'm talking about in a second. Starting in verse 19, he comes off by saying, uh, how precious are your thoughts, God, how vast is the sum of them. And then verse 19, if only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. Goodness gracious. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So what is he talking about here? Why, why does he shift from... God, you are so, you know everything about me, you created me so carefully, and then God, why don't you just kill everyone who opposes you? Like, what a, what a shift. And, um, and, and so what, what's, what's, he, uh, what's he talking about here? Now, remember, this is, what, what we're looking at here, this is poetic language. If you've been with us on our Wednesday nights, on our summer Wednesdays, every Wednesday we're going through teachings of kind of what the Bible is. And this past week we talked about literary genres of the Bible and we talked about poetry. And so if you were there, this, this may um, ring a bell with you. And if not, then you should join us this coming Wednesday, every Wednesday throughout the summer. They're really great. But this is poetic language. This isn't meant to be taken literally. This isn't David literally saying, God, let's develop a plan together where we murder everyone who opposes you. That's, that's not... What's going on here? David isn't trying to get, necessarily get God to do something. He's expressing his real concern about the wickedness that he sees in the world. However, he doesn't just talk about the wickedness that he sees in the world. He goes on in verse 23 to then say, Search me, God, and see if there's any offensive way in me. He's not just saying, God, everyone is so wicked. Look at all the wickedness. God, just deal with them. He's saying, God, why don't you deal with this wickedness in the world, but also deal with me. Examine me. See if there's any way that I am like that, if there's any wicked way in me, any blind spots that I have, and reveal it to me and lead me away from that and lead me to you. See, we as Christians, we, can, we are very good at pointing out the wickedness of those around us. We are real good at seeing the wickedness that is in the world and pointing it out. But man, we are not always real good at pointing out that which is within us. We are not great all the time, and myself included, at asking God, where am I just like what I am pointing out? Where do I have an offensive way in me? Where have I gone my own way and gone away from you? God, reveal that to me and then lead me away from it and lead me to you. You see, this is the theme running throughout this chapter. He's saying, God, you know me, you're with me, you created me, and now search me and see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me away from it to the way everlasting. See, asking God to examine me is such an important idea because honestly, I think it's easy for us to fall in one of two camps. 
And I, and I, don't, I don't mind saying this because I have at times fallen in each of these camps. We can, we can fall on one side of, 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 the, of the coin and really lean into the wonderfully made side. Not I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am really wonderfully made. I am so wonderfully made that I don't need anybody. I don't, I don't, I'm good the way I am. I don't need anyone to come up around me. God, I, I, we may not say this actually with our lips, but God, I don't, I, don't, I don't really need you. I'm good. Things are going well. I'm good. I'm fine. Or we can fall on the opposite side of the spectrum and look at us and say, God, I don't, I, I, I so much don't deserve you that I am beyond saving. God, I'm, I'm too far gone. Move on. There's nothing you can do with me. Because I know my thoughts, I know my actions, and I know that I'm, I'm a waste of your time. And what I want to say is, the, the interesting thing is, both sides of this coin have the exact same problem. They are completely focused on me. Whether I think I'm too good to need saving, or whether I think I'm too bad to get saving, either way, it's totally focused on me and not focused on Christ. However, I think the truth lands right in the middle. I think there's truth to both of these sides, but the actual truth about our existence lands right in the middle. That's that you are wonderfully made, but you are also in desperate need of a Savior. You are wonderfully, wonderfully made. In fact, you could look at the person next to you and say, you are wonderfully made. In fact, you should look at the person next to you and say, you are wonderfully made. And this is very sweet that every couple turned to each other. So you could turn to someone who's not your spouse, especially guys in the room. You could turn to another guy and say, dude, you are wonderfully made. Because, that's right, a fist bump there. I like that. See, this isn't... This doesn't need to... uh, make us uncomfortable. You are wonderfully made, and that is an absolute fact. But you are also in desperate, desperate need of a Savior. And so am I. And so am I. And this is why Jesus came. He came, God sent his Son to a people that were wonderfully made. He sent them because we are created in his image, but we have fallen woefully short. He, he sent his Son for the offensive way that is in all of us, to save us from that and lead us in the way everlasting. And so as we close today, this is the verse. These are the two verses we're going we're gonna to commit to memory today. If you're new with us every week throughout this series, we've been uh, trying to commit a verse or two or sometimes a chapter to memory. And uh, we're going to do that together today. And the point of this is not to see if we can get all the words right and so that on the last slide, when all the words are gone, we can, we, we did a good job and we get some candy at Sunday school. But the point is to try and actually commit this to memory, to try and commit this to memory so that as we are living our lives, it's much easier to live out scripture if we actually know what it says. And so up on the screen is these, this entire verses. We're going to read them aloud together. We're going to read them multiple times together and try and commit this to memory. So let's start by just reading this through together. Search me, God, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's read it straight through again. Search me, God, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now let's take take away a few words. Search me, God, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's take away a few more. Search me, God, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I'll take away all the words and you guys take it away. Here we 
Hey, we all have an offensive way in us. But the prayer is, God, reveal it to me and lead me away from it and lead me in your way. Lead me in the way everlasting. So as we close today, I'm going to pray for us. And one thing that I think would be is, is a good thing, a good practice for us is just to pray scripture. If you ever want to pray and you're unsure what to pray, pray scripture. And so if you would, bow your head, close your eyes. I'm just going to pray Psalm 139 over us today. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. But search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting.